Section 8 of Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Orléans. The summer now drawing near, I determined to spend the rest of it in some more remote town on the river Loire, and on 19th of April I took leave of Paris, and by the way of the messenger agreed for my passage to Orléans. The way from Paris to this city, as indeed most of the roads in France, is paved with a small square freestone, so that the country does not much molest the traveller with dirt and ill way, as in England. Only it is somewhat hard to the poor horse's feet, which causes them to ride more temperately, seldom going out of the trot, or grand pas, as they call it. We pass divers walled towns or villages, among others of note Chartres and Etampes, where we lay the first night. This has a fair church. The next day we had an excellent road, but had liked to come short home, for no sooner were we entered two or three leagues into the forest of Orléans, which extends itself many miles, but the company behind us were set on by rogues, who, shooting from the hedges and frequent covert, slew four upon the spot. Among the slain was a captain of Swiss of the regiment of Picardy, a person much lamented. This disaster made such an alarm in Orléans at our arrival that the prévôt marshal, with his assistants, going in pursuit, brought in two whom they had shot and exposed them in the great market-place to see if any would take cognizance of them. I had great cause to give God thanks for this escape, when coming to Orléans and lying at the White Cross, I found Mr. John Nicholas, eldest son to Mr. Secretary. In the night a cat kittened on my bed, and left on it a young one having six ears, eight legs, two bodies from the middle downward, and two tails. I found it dead but warm in the morning when I awaked. 21st April 1644 I went about to view the city which is well built of stone on the side of the Loire. About the middle of the river is an island full of walks and fair trees with some houses. This is contiguous to the town by a stately stone bridge reaching to the opposite suburbs, built likewise on the edge of a hill, from whence is a beautiful prospect. At one of the extremes of the bridge are strong towers, and about the middle on one side is a statue of the Virgin Mary or Pieta with the dead Christ in her lap, as big as the life. At one side of the cross kneels Charles the Seventh, armed, and at the other Joan d'Arc, armed also like a cavalier with boots and spurs, her hair dishevelled as the deliverers of the town from our countrymen when they besieged it. The figures are all cast in copper, with a pedestal full of inscriptions, as well as a fair column joining it, which is all adorned with fleur-de-lis and a crucifix, with two saints proceeding, as it were, from two branches out of the capital. The inscriptions on the cross are in Latin, Mors Christi in cruce nos a contagione, labis et eternorum morborum sanavit. On the pedestal, Rex in hoc signo hostes profrigavit, et Johanna Virgo oralem obsidio liberavit, non juab impis deruta restituta sunt hoc anno dune. 1578. Chambure M.F. Octano qui galliam servitute Britannica liberavit. A domino factum est illud, et est mirabile in oculis nostris, in quora memoria hic nostri fidei insignia. To this is made an annual procession on 12th of May, mass being sung before it, attended with great ceremony and concourse of people. The wine of this place is so strong that the king's cup-bearers are, as I was assured, sworn never to give the king any of it, but it is a very noble liquor, and much of it transported into other countries. 
The town is much frequented by strangers, especially Germans, for the great purity of the language here spoken, as well as for divers other privileges, and the university, which causes the English to make no long sojourn here, except such as can drink and debauch. The city stands in the Count of Beals, Blaisois, was once styled a kingdom, afterward a duchy, as at present, belonging to the second son of France. Many councils have been held here, and some kings crowned. The university is very ancient, divided now by the students into that of four nations, French, High Dutch, Normans, and Picardine, who have each their respective protectors, several officers, treasurers, consuls, seals, etc. There are in it two reasonable fair public libraries, whence one may borrow a book to one's chamber, giving but a note underhand, which is an extraordinary custom, and a confidence that has cost many libraries dear. The first church I went to visit was Saint Croix. It has been a stately fabric, but now much ruined by the late civil wars. They report the tower of it to have been the highest in France. There is the beginning of a fair reparation. About this cathedral there is a very spacious cemetery. The town house is also very nobly built, with a high tower to it. The marketplace and streets, somewhere of are deliciously planted with limes, are ample and straight, so well paved with a kind of pebble that I have not seen a neater town in France. In fine, this city was by France first esteemed the most agreeable of his vast dominions. 28th April 1644 Taking boat on the Loire, I went toward Blois, the passage and river being both very pleasant. Passing Mayer, we dined at Beaugency and slept at a little town called Saint-Dieu. Quitting our bark, we hired horses to Blois by the way of Chambord, a famous house of the kings, built by Francis I in the middle of a solitary park, full of deer, enclosed with a wall. I was particularly desirous of seeing this palace from the extravagance of the design, especially the staircase mentioned by Palladio. It is said that 1,800 workmen were constantly employed in this fabric for 12 years. If so, it is wonderful that it was not finished, it being no greater than diverse gentlemen's houses in England, both for room and circuit. The carvings are indeed very rich and full. The staircase is devised with four entries or ascents which cross one another, so that though four persons meet, they never come in sight but by small loopholes, till they land. It consists of 274 steps, as I remember, and is an extraordinary work, but of far greater expense than use or beauty. The chimneys of the house appear like so many towers. About the whole is a large, deep moat. The country about is full of corn and wine, with many fair noblemen's houses. Blois we arrived at Blois in the evening. The town is hilly, uneven and rugged, standing on the side of the Loire, having suburbs joined by a stately stone bridge, on which is a pyramid with an inscription. At the entrance of the castle is a stone statue of Louis XII on horseback, as large as life, under a Gothic state, and a little below are these words, Hic ubi natus erat dextro ludovicus olimpo, sum sit honorata regia sceptra manu, Felix quae tontai fulsit lux non sia regis, Gallica non alio, principe digna fuit. Under this is a very wide pair of gates, nailed full of wolves and wild boars' heads. Behind the castle, the present Duke Gaston had begun a fair building, through which we walked into a large garden, esteemed for its furniture one of the fairest, especially for simples and exotic plants, in which he takes extraordinary delight. On the right hand is a long gallery, full of ancient statues and inscriptions, both of marble and brass, 
the length, 300 paces, divides the garden into higher and lower ground, having a very noble fountain. There is the portrait of a heart taken in the forest by Louis XII, which has 24 antlers on its head. In the collegiate church of saint Savior, we saw many sepulchres of the Earl of Blois. On Sunday, being May Day, we walked up into Pall Mall, very long and so noble, shaded with tall trees, being in the midst of a great wood, that unless that of Tours, I had not seen a statelier. From hence, we proceeded with a friend of mine through the adjoining forest to see if we could meet any wolves, which are here in such numbers that they often come and take children out of the very streets. Yet will not the Duke, who is sovereign here, permit them to be destroyed? We walked five or six miles outright, but met with none. Yet a gentleman who was resting himself under a tree with his horse grazing by him told us that half an hour before two wolves had set upon his horse and had in probability devoured him but for a dog which lay by him. At a little village at the end of this wood we ate excellent cream and visited a castle builded on a very steep cliff. Blois is a town where the language is exactly spoken, the inhabitants very courteous, the air so good that it is the ordinary nursery of the king's children. The people are so ingenious that for goldsmith's work and watches no place in France affords the like. The pastures by the river are very rich and pleasant. 2nd May 1644 we took boat again, passing by Charmont, a proud castle on the left hand, before it is a sweet island, deliciously shaded with tall trees. A little distance from hence we went on shore at Amboise, a very agreeable village, built of stone, and the houses covered with blue slate, as the towns on the Loire generally are. But the castle chiefly invited us, the thickness of whose towers from the river to the top was admirable. We entered by the drawbridge, which has an invention to let one fall if not premonished. It is full of halls and spacious chambers, and one staircase is large enough and sufficiently commodious to receive a coach and land it on the very tower, as they told us had been done. There is some artillery in it, but that which is most observable is in the ancient chapel, viz. a stag's head or branches hung up by chains consisting of twenty brow antlers, the beam bigger than a man's middle and of incredible length. Indeed, it is monstrous, and yet I cannot conceive how it should be artificial. They show also the ribs and vertebrae of the same beast, but these might be made of whalebone. Leaving the castle, we passed Mont Louis, a village having no houses above ground, but such only as a hewn out of the main rocks of excellent freestone. Here and there the funnel of a chimney appears on the surface among the vineyards which are over them, and in this manner they inhabit the caves, as it were sea cliffs, on one side of the river for many miles. Tour. We now came within sight of Tour, where we were designed for the rest of the time I had resolved to stay in France, the sojournment being so agreeable. Tours is situate on the east side of a hill on the river Loire, having a fair bridge of stone called saint Edme. The streets are very long, straight, spacious, well built and exceeding clean. The suburbs large and pleasant, joined to the city by another bridge. Both the church and monastery of St. Martin are large, of Gothic building, having four square towers, fair organs and a stately altar, where they show the bones and ashes of St. Martin, with other relics. The mall, without comparison, is the noblest in Europe for length and shade, having seven rows of the tallest and goodliest elms I had ever beheld, the innermost of which do so embrace each other and at such a height that nothing can be more solemn and majestical. Here we played a party or party or two and then walked about the town walls, built of square stone, filled with earth and having a moat. 
no city in France exceeds it in beauty or delight. 6th May 1644 We went to saint Gassion, reported to have been built by our countrymen. The dial and clockwork are much esteemed. The church has two handsome towers and spires of stone, and the whole fabric is very noble and venerable. To this joins the palace of the archbishop, consisting both of old and new building, with many fair rooms and a fair garden. Here I grew acquainted with our Monsieur Meret, a very good musician. The archbishop treated me very courteously. We visited diverse other churches, chapels and monasteries, for the most part neatly built and full of pretty paintings, especially the convent of the Capuchins which has a prospect over the whole city and many fair walks. 8th May 1644 I went to see their manufactures in silk, for in this town they drive a very considerable trade with silkworms, their pressing and watering the grograms and camlets with weights of an extraordinary poise put into a rolling engine. Here I took a master of the language and studied the tongue very diligently, recreating myself sometimes at the mall and sometimes about the town. The house opposite my lodging had been formerly a king's palace. The outside was totally covered with fleur-de-lis, embossed out of the stone. Here Mary de' Medicis held her court when she was compelled to retire from Paris by the persecution of the great cardinal. 25th May 1644 was the fête d'eau and a goodly procession of all the religious orders, the whole streets hung with their best tapestries and their most precious movables exposed, silks, damasks, velvets, plate and pictures in abundance, the streets strewed with flowers and full of pageantry, banners and bravery. 6th June 1644 I went by water to visit that goodly and venerable abbe of Marmoutier, being one of the greatest in the kingdom. To it is a very ample church of stone, with a very high pyramid. Among other relics, the monks showed us is the holy ampoule, the same with that which sacres their kings at Reims, this being the one that anointed Henry the Fourth. Ascending many steps, we went into the abbot's palace, where we were showed a vast tun, as big as that at Heidelberg, which they report St. Martin, as I remember, filled from one cluster of grapes growing there. 7th June 1644. We walked about two miles from the city to an agreeable solitude called Duplessis, a house belonging to the king. It has many pretty gardens, full of nightingales, and in the chapel lies buried the famous poet Ronsard. Returning, we stepped into a convent of Franciscans called Saint Cosmo, where the cloister is painted with the miracles of their St. Francis Apola, whose ashes lie in their chapel with this inscription, Corpus Sancti Francis Apola, 1507, 13 Aprilis, Concremato Vero Ab Horatius, Anno 1562, Cuius Quidem Ossa et Cineres Hic Jacent. The tomb has four small pyramids of marble at each corner. 9th June 1644. I was invited to a vineyard which was so artificially planted and supported with arched poles that stooping down one might see from end to end a very great length under the vines the bunches hanging down in abundance. 20th June 1644 We took horse to see certain natural caves called Gutierre near Colombier where there is a spring within the bowels of the earth very deep and so excessive cold that the drops meeting with some lapidescent matter it converts them into a hard stone which hangs about it like icicles having many others in the form of confiture and sugar plums as we call them near this we went under the ground almost two furlongs lighted with candles 
to see the source and spring which serves the whole city by a passage cut through the main rock of freestone. 28th June 1644 I went to see the palace and gardens of Chevreux, a sweet place. 30th June 1644 I walked through the vineyards as far as Roche Corbe to the ruins of an old and very strong castle said to have been built by the English of great height on the precipice of a dreadful cliff from whence the country and river yield a most incomparable prospect. 27th July 1644 I heard excellent music at the Jesuits who have here a school and convent but a mean chapel. We have now store of those admirable melons so much celebrated in France for the best in the kingdom. 1st August 1644 My valet, one Garrow, a Spaniard, born in Biscayo, having misbehaved, I was forced to discharge him. He demanded of me, besides his wages, no less than a hundred crowns to carry him to his country. Refusing to pay it as no part of our agreement, he had the impudence to arrest me. The next day I was to appear in court, where both our advocates pleaded before the Lieutenant Civil, but it was so unreasonable a pretence that the judge had not patience to hear it out. The judge immediately acquitted me, after he had reproached the avocat, who took part with my servant. He rose from the bench and, making a courteous excuse to me, that being a stranger I should be so used, he conducted me through the court to the street door. This varlet afterward threatened to pistol me. The next day I waited on the lieutenant to thank him for his great civility. 18th August 1644 The Queen of England came to Tours, having newly arrived in France and going for Paris. She was very nobly received by the people and clergy, who went to meet her with the trained bands. After the harangue, the Archbishop entertained her at his palace, where I paid my duty to her. The 20th she set forward to Paris. 8th September 1644. Two of my kinsmen came from Paris to this place, where I settled them in their pension and exercises. 14th September 1644. We took post for Richelieu, passing by Lille Bouchard, a village in the way. The next day we arrived and went to see the Cardinal's palace near it. The town is built in a low marshy ground, having a narrow river cut by hand, very even and straight, capable of bringing up a small vessel. It consists of only one considerable street, the houses on both sides, as indeed throughout the town, built exactly uniform, after a modern handsome design. It has a large, goodly market house and place, opposite to which is the church, built of freestone, having two pyramids of stone which stand hollow from the towers. The church is well built and of a well-ordered architecture, within handsomely paved and adorned. To this place belongs an academy, where besides the exercise of the horse, arms, dancing, etc., all the sciences are taught in the vulgar French by professors stipendiated by the great cardinal, who by this, the cheap living there, and divers privileges, not only design the improvement of the vulgar language, but to draw people and strangers to the town. But since the Cardinal's death it is thinly inhabited, standing so much out of the way and in a place not well situated for health or pleasure. He was allured to build by the name of the place and an old house there belonging to his ancestors. This pretty town is handsomely walled about and moated, with a kind of slight fortification, two fair gates and drawbridges. Before the gate, toward the palace, is a spacious circle where the fair is annually kept. About a flight shot from the town is the Cardinal's house, a princely pile, though on an old design, not altogether gothic, but mixed and environed by a clear moat. The rooms are stately, 
most richly furnished with tissue, damask, arras and velvet, pictures, statues, vases and all sorts of antiquities, especially the Caesars in oriental alabaster. The long gallery is painted with the famous acts of the founder, the roof with the life of Julius Caesar, and at the end of it is a cupola or singing theatre supported by very stately pillars of black marble. The chapel anciently belonged to the family of the founder. The court is very ample. The gardens without are very large, and the parterres of excellent embroidery set with many statues of brass and marble. The groves, meadows and walks are a real paradise. End of section 8